Hello everybody, my name is Zach and welcome to my channel. I'm here uh, near Windsor with Matt Easton. Hiya. Um, is Scholar Gladiatoria your last name? or <laughs> no, Matt Easton of Scholar, Scholar Gladiatoria. There we go. <laughs> so uh, Matt Easton is here and we've been uh, um, doing stuff with horses and weapons and it's been great fun. Um, and we're about to um, have some lunch, have a bit of a break. So I thought I'd talk about um, one of my favourite parts of a very well-known document. And I think you're going to do another part of that document on your channel, talking more about the... Uh, At a later point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but here we are. This is How a Man Shall Be Armed. And uh, um, a lot of people, a lot of things have been written and, and spoken about uh, how a man shall be armed and the armour and, mm. and what he's carrying and things mm. like that. Um, it's quite interesting some of the things that he says is basically not in anything else absolutely I mean it's a very it's a very scarce source isn't it and it, it gives us some nuggets of information which we don't really find anywhere else and then the, therefore there's always the debate about is this normal is this unusual yeah. you know and do we do we do we do that does everybody in living history copy exactly what he says or should it only be done by some people in what situations and, yeah yeah and it, it's hard because we don't know, uh, it, it's not like one of the later manuals where someone high up is writing something for the whole army, is it? Um, no, not at all. It's, it's very much one person's opinion and one person's advice. Yeah. To who? For whom? We don't know who was... In what situation gonna, And this is a talking? manuscript, yeah. isn't it? So this yeah. isn't a printed document. Yeah. So who is it written for? For what purpose? You know, is it for a specific type of... Duel, nightly yeah. duel, or tournament, or, or war, or you know. Yeah. So. so one of the really nice things about this document is that um, at, it's got how to put your armor on, and then at the end it's got like a little shopping list, um, which means maybe the guy is even writing it for himself or, or his squire or something. Yeah. Um, but it's got a nice little shopping list of other things that you need if you're going to um, be in armor. So I've got some of those things here. Uh, Matt, you noticed that. Some of these, hang on a second. Now, Matt, you notice that these are not really very authentic, are they? <laughs> well, the swords are, but the, yeah, the food is obviously the modern equivalent uh, that you, yeah. you've gone with here uh, for the purposes of this video. But, you know, wine is wine to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Obviously, modern wine's not exactly the same as medieval wine, but yeah. uh, this one has got some fully authentic jousters on it. Yeah, course. absolutely. We've, we've got bread and we've got a Spanish tapas selection. Yeah. Um, with, so yeah. So, so in the document it says uh, that a man should bring five loaves to his table okay. when he's so getting we've got armed a spare up. Here, we've got a spare here. <laughs> That's uh, one of those is for our cameraman, uh, <laughs> and it, it also says uh, rather unhelpfully just some meat or fish. So we don't know what that was. We don't know uh, how much of it it was. Maybe it depended on what day it was as well. If it was Friday, yeah. it was fish. And yeah, yeah. absolutely. He is very specific about the wine. I think it's four gallons of wine. Wow. Okay. I think, so, what I'll do, if that's wrong, then I'll just dub over it with the, <laughs> with the right number. But um, there's a lot of wine. Basically, there's a lot of wine. So okay. the question is, um, is he bringing this for himself and for the other person as like a show of chivalry? Yeah. Um, or the other possibility is that maybe this is for him and his entire retinue. That's not um, a lot of food, though, is it, for, well, we, for a whole retinue? But I mean, five, well, we I don't know how we big the loaves exactly, are. We don't know, we how, don't know how much meat it is. So, <laughs> True. Uh, but I think what, what's, what's interesting, there's carb, yeah. there's, uh, there's protein, yeah. and there's um, sugars in the wine. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it might not be isotonic drinks, but it, <laughs> it'll keep you on your feet Absolutely. If, uh, if you're flagging. Um, okay. Another thing that it says, here we go, I've got, again, modern nails, modern hammer, but it says that you should bring nails and a hammer, uh, and also some spare points, um, which is, I think is really quite interesting. It tells us that it's quite normal for armour to fail. So with the hammer and the nails definitely for the armour? Um, that, that is the feeling, because okay. it also says to bring a stake for, uh, so an armour is steak. Oh, really? So, so, so this something is for replacing dented. rivets, basically. Right. Oh, I see, yeah. to, to rivet on. Okay. Yeah, so you've got, uh, you should have uh, spare laces to lace your armour on. So in this case, the nails are uh, 
gal obviously modern yeah, galvanized um sort of roofing nails i think aren't they but um so we'll be talking about steel or iron rivets so um, these would be yeah because the word nail used then yeah actually could be applied to lots of different things yeah it? so yeah so yeah so the assumption is it's replacement in rivets and as you and i both know rivets go sometimes yeah. don't they it can, yeah. it can be a rivet on an articulation yeah. or it could be a rivet holding a strap on uh, or it could be that the strap breaks so you have to take that leather strap off and replace it and yeah. rivet a new one yeah. on so the, it might not be actually the rivet that breaks it might be the thing that the rivet holds on I was doing a six day joust at Arundel yeah. and my arm armour came apart on the first day <laughs> <laughs> and I was so glad uh, Kevin Legg from Plessis Armoury oh, yeah. was there yeah. uh, and he was He's able to there with yeah. a portable forge isn't he yeah, yeah he was there with his forge and he was able to put it back together again but it's so important and I think we don't realise that and we don't think about that quite so much is that yeah. it was the expected thing that armour would fail Yeah. and you know you needed to be ready you mm. couldn't just be running around yeah. asking and, if anyone had anything to yeah, help Yeah and, and, and you know whether we call them armourers or whether it's uh, forms of different forms of smith travelling with a retinue or yeah. certainly travelling with an army on campaign incredibly yeah. important yeah. Uh, resource and even even up until the 19th century you know every regiment had an armourer yeah. and we often see on antiques things that have been we can tell the difference between something that's been repaired by the type of person who makes swords or lances yeah. or whatever versus a regimental armour of repair because yeah. usually they're a little bit cruder they're using what they have available mm. um, and very occasionally we find things that have been put together by an armour out of spare bits that have been lying around. Yeah. You also see it on art, which is even more interesting. Mm. Like, I'm, it's all interesting, but mm. um, they actually copy the fixes onto effigies and, and statues and things. Is that, mm -hmm. it, it was expected that this would happen. You know, you don't just buy one armour and, and then it... It's yours for forever yeah. and, and never fails. So the, so these three things are, so the hammer, the nails, and the stake, the armor yeah. stake, are essentially a set of three things yeah. because you can't do any of that yeah. with the, without the full set of yeah. three, really, can you? Absolutely. And then the last thing, so I've, I've brought a cloth. Um, it says, a kerchief with which to heal your visor. <laughs> heal no, your visor? Heal your visor. So this is really interesting to me because... Uh, it's less of a problem when you're wearing a sallet. But when you're wearing a grand bassinet or a um, or a, an armette, yeah. especially in the jousting ones with, yeah. the, with the solid visors that don't have as many holes in, yeah. your breath uh, condenses on the visor. Okay. And you, get, you can have a river running down your front. And it's really okay. uncomfortable. So a, um, a kerchief to mop the inside of your visor okay. in between bouts it is actually really, really useful. And I've found personally that it makes it much more comfortable to continue fighting um, when you're wearing those helmets. Really? Yeah. Not having wet on the inside of the visor? Yeah. So what problems does it cause? Well, whenever you, you know, you're getting hot in there, it's foggy, yeah. you've got condensation you can feel the the moisture in the air it gets yeah. quite humid just yeah. you've got your own little microclimate inside yeah, it's your like a sauna yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely it's a face sauna. yeah and and so it it makes it a bit trickier to breathe and obviously some of that can be sorted with conditioning but it, it was and i would never have thought of it if it wasn't actually in there a, mm. a kerchief to heal the visor and it mm. the um the helmet that he suggests is also a bassinet so okay so that also adds to that you know and this is, is he talking, does he specify combat on foot mounted or? Yeah, on foot. On foot, on foot, on foot. right. So. Right, okay. So that, I mean, typically in England, the great bassinet continued yeah. in use later than in most other places and was yeah. particularly favoured for foot combats with poleaxe or sure. two-handed sword, even um, through to the Tudor period uh, to some extent. I think. Yeah. Um, interesting. There so is So it's definitely not... When it, to heal your visor yeah. is not in any way to keep it fixed down or to... I mean, it... this is one of the big problems, right? <laughs> this is one of the big problems because there's no dictionary no. It, from the 15th century of terms like this. The so... closest thing I can think of is, is uh, Florio's dictionary mm. of, the, of around 1600 where if you know the Italian word for yeah. something, you can look up the English word for it and that's been very useful in fencing yeah. treatises. But... Um, Interesting, because one of the things that comes to my mind is is in modern uh, 
sort of recreated armor, often there are things to hold the visor down mm. and hold it closed. Yeah. Whereas on a lot of certainly 15th century armor, we don't necessarily have that. Yeah. So you, the question is, did did they find some other way of keeping their visors closed? So that's when you question. first said it, that was what I thought of. Okay. Not suggesting that that's. Well, I tell it. you what, that can be that can be a follow up, guys. <laughs> hang on a second, I'm going to turn this around again. Okay, so um, yeah, if you think that you've got a better idea about what any of that might mean, obviously this is, like I said, it's just a shopping list at the bottom of this, uh, this document. He doesn't really go into that much detail, mm. but I thought those were really interesting things and worth sharing. Um, if you can think of something else that uh, might also explain those inclusions in the list, then do leave a comment down below. If you've got any questions, uh, or any ideas for future videos, then leave them as well. And of course, like and subscribe and share and all of that. You'll also find the link to Matt's video about this um, in, the, uh, in the description, but you've probably already watched it. If you're into swords and, and armor and things like that, you've probably already seen that. You might have even come over from Matt's channel. So if that's you, say hello, uh, leave a like and, uh, uh, and subscribe, that would be great. Thank cool. you very much, Matt. My pleasure.